Uh, good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting of the City of Tucson Planning Commission. My name is Lexi Wellett, and I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. The responsibilities of this body are to advise the Mayor and Council and the Planning and Development Services Department on the adoption of long-range plans, policies, specific plans, and regulations that affect land use and development. Before I have staff call the roll, I wanted to uh, introduce our newest commissioner, um, uh, Commissioner Walzak, is that correct? Walzak, um, thank you for joining us and welcome. We're really excited to have you and being able to start on time is, is huge for us. So thank you um, for, for joining the commission. Um, so uh, will staff please call the roll? Certainly, thank you, Chair Wallet. Uh, Chair Wallet. Present. Vice Chair ortiz Pino. Present. Commissioner Cassidy. Commissioner Kenny. Commissioner Lampo. Commissioner McCancy. Here. Commissioner Martin. Here. Commissioner Schwartz. Commissioner Small. Present. Commissioner Walzak. Present. Commissioner Young. And Commissioner Zagir. Okay, let the record reflect that a quorum is in fact present. Thank you. Thank you. Of legal action minutes uh, for the legal action report of September 4th, 2024. Um, the chair would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the action report for. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Very good. So that was Commissioner Martin with the motion, Commissioner Lampa with the second. So uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the legal action report for September 4th, 2024, say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion passes. So that brings us to item number three, which is the ADU and zoning timeline code amendments for public hearing. Would staff please provide their presentation for item number three? Yes, thank you, Chair Wallet. Uh, what we're here tonight to discuss are the or is the proposed code amendment relating to both ADU regulations and zoning timelines. Um, next slide, please. So the, the state legislation um, that is up on the screen are a series of bills that came through the state legislature this year relating to uh, municipal zoning and housing. Uh, these bills were uh, adopted and, and intended to facilitate, facilitate greater housing availability by increasing opportunities to, for diverse housing types and streamlining the process to address housing availability through housing supply. Um, four of these bills require local municipalities, including the city of Tucson, to amend their zoning codes. Um, of these bills, the first three listed above have a deadline of January first, 2025, for municipalities to amend their ordinance to comply with the new rules. Um, the fourth listed, the middle housing bill, has a deadline of January 1st, 2026, for local code adoption. And I know you've seen this before, but I just wanted to give a little bit more context to anyone who uh, is, is not familiar with this. And so to address these bills, I'm having a, uh, mayor and council, provided some direction to both city staff uh, and ultimately provide direction to city staff at their June 18th meeting, authoring us to develop the code changes required to, uh, to address any necessary changes to our code. Um, staff determined that the code changes need to be, needed to be made by January 1st to address specific requirements related to ADUs and for zoning timelines. Um, following this authorization by mayor and council, staff began working to identify what changes to the city's timeline and ADU standards are required. And then at the September 4th, 2024 meeting, 
uh, we presented these to the Planning Commission at a study session in the commission said uh, this evening, September 4th, uh, September 24th, 2024, as the date for the public hearing, it's a lot of fours. And so at that study session, oh, yeah. Okay, apologize. At that study session, uh, the Planning Commission reviewed this items and there are a couple of uh, discussions that occurred on some, some specific items. So I want to follow up with um, how we have addressed these, these comments. Uh, the first is a question about the exception to the 180 day rezoning timeline requirement for historic buildings and pads. So there's a question that Commissioner Martin brought up and uh, staff went back and looked into this and uh, determined that those indeed should be exempted from the timeline requirement as the legislation reads. And so there were some changes made to the red line ordinance to clarify that pads and historic properties are exempt from that requirement on the rezoning. So that is a change from the study session. Absolutely. Um, we also looked into deed restrictions for an affordable housing unit as an ADU. Um, there is a provision in the state law where if you, you may be able to put a third ADU on a property if the property is over one acre in size and it is designated as an affordable unit. Uh, there's a question about how you would uh, document that that was affordable and whether or not it would be appropriate to include that as a deed restriction. Uh, based on our analysis and read of that, the law specifically calls out a deed restriction as the mechanism for ensuring the affordability of that unit, that third ADU unit, so we left that in there because it is specifically uh, given us the authority and essentially requesting us to do that under the state law. So there was no change made there. Um, we also looked into a question about addressing ADUs in front yards. Um, there were some questions about whether lot frontage uh, implied that an ADU would be able to be uh, permitted within a front yard of a structure. Uh, we coordinated with legal on that and determined that front yard and lot, front, lot frontage are different things and therefore we're continuing to, uh, as the previous red line ordinance showed, not permit ADUs in front yards of structures. So there is no change made there. Uh, there is also one minor change made for clarification's sake uh, relating to side and rear setbacks. Uh, the um, red line ordinance had previously taken language directly from the state law, which talked about perimeter yard. And instead we went back based on feedback from the commission and clarified that to mean side and rear setbacks, just so that there wasn't any question. And that also relates to the, the front yard question a, a little bit, just so that when people are administering this ordinance or looking to pr propose the development of an ADU, they know more clearly what we're talking about. And so that was, those were the changes that were made or were not made based on the questions that came back from the, um, from the planning commission. And so let me then loop back just to give a real quick overview of what, what we've already discussed in terms of um, other questions that, uh, or, or other changes that are being proposed. Um, so I'm gonna switch back to the zoning timeline question for just a second, and then come back to ADUs. Um, as, as we mentioned before, the zoning examiner legislative procedure applies to rezonings or special exceptions requiring mayor and council approval. Currently, this requires a public hearing within 70 days of application submittal. This is in our code, the UDC. Um, also in our code, the, con the concurrent plan amendment or rezoning application deadline for the zoning examiner public hearing is 180 days. Uh, we also currently have no deadline for mayor and council approval. Uh, the only deadline that we have is for the mayor and council public hearing noted above. So that's our, our current situation. So to become compliant with the act, the state law, we are uh, proposing the following amendments related to the zoning timeline. 
Uh, we want to, we're proposing to amend the zoning examiner legislative procedure to establish that an administrative, that administrative reviews of zoning applications must be completed within 30 days of receiving the application. Um, we are also establishing or proposing to establish that the city shall approve or deny a zoning application within 180 days after determining that the application is complete. Uh, currently for rezoning cases, we're requiring a zoning examiner public hearing to be held within 70 days of the application submittal. Uh, and then also we're looking at exempting historic landmarks, historic preservation zones, national register designated places and pads from the proposed zoning timeline requirements, as I had mentioned earlier, based on commission feedback. So those are the changes that we're proposing to the zoning timeline. So now we'll move into the ADU or accessory dwelling unit changes. Um, so House Bill 20, 2720 establishes state standards for ADUs, which the city must comply with by January 1st. This is for cities with a population of over 75,000. There's a requirement that cities of that size must adopt regulations to allow for ADUs. We've certainly gone through that process and allow them. Um, however, some modifications are necessary to become fully compliant with the state law. If we fail to adopt these changes by the January 1st, 2025 deadline, then ADUs will be allowed on all lots zoned for residential use within the city without limits. And so that's why it's very important that, that we uh, work through this process so that we can ensure that we're able to continue to regulate ADUs by local standards. So in terms of what is proposed for change in order to become compliant with state law, uh, the table above shows our current regulations in Tucson and the proposed changes based on House Bill 2720. There are really five primary areas where we're looking at making changes here. One is on the number of ADUs allowed per lot. Our current standards allow one ADU per residential lot. However, under the new regulations, there would generally be two allowed per lot with the third ADU allowed, provided it's, a, it's an affordable unit on lots of one acre or larger in size. So two to three would be allowed. Uh, also, the way that the size of a permitted ADU is calculated is proposed to be changed. Um, so instead of basing it on the size of the lot as it currently stands, the permitted size of the ADU would be based on the uh, size of the primary structure and could be seven, up to 75% of the size of the primary structure up to 1,000 square feet. Uh, the way that height, maximum height would be calculated for an ADU uh, is also proposed for change. Uh, currently, it's generally limited to 12 foot feet in height or if the primary structure is two stories, then it would be the height of the primary residence. Uh, however, under the new state law, height would be calculated based on the zoning district when the ADU is located. So it would no longer be tied to the height of the primary residence. It would simply be tied to whatever the maximum height is in that zoning district. Uh, parking, there are also some changes. Currently, we have some parking requirements. Generally, it's one space per unit with some provisions for varying that parking requirement if you're located on um, a bike boulevard or something similar. Um, however, under the new standard, it would be no additional parking may be required for the ADU. So we would proposing to remove the parking requirements. And then also there would be some changes to setbacks. Uh, currently, setbacks follow the zone, generally six feet or two thirds the height of the structure for side and rear setbacks. And under the new regulation, uh, required rear and side setbacks can't be more than five feet from the property line, which means that you cannot establish a setback of greater than five feet. So 
So when we um, were putting together these proposed changes, we conducted a couple of community listening sessions in July, uh, both of them virtual, one during the day and one during the evening to get community feedback. Uh, there are a, a couple of common themes that we heard when we were uh, listening to the community and what people had to say. Um, some of them included addressing housing affordability concerns through the construction of ADUs, uh, regulation of short-term rentals, um, the impacts that ADUs could have on historic preservation zones, historic landmarks, national registered designated or listed properties, um, all, all of those types of historic properties. Uh, this one we heard quite a lot, the desire for new standards to be as flexible as possible, as possible instead of more restrictive and the desire, which would be more flexible, to allow both detached and attached ADUs on a lot, depending on whatever the property owner wanted to do, whatever was best for that specific site. So based on these requirements and the feedback that we received, we have developed or proposed the following amendments to the city's unified development code to comply with the requirements of House Bill 2720. Uh, we will are proposing to increase the maximum number of ADUs to allow two attached or detached ADUs per lot and a third affordable unit on one acre or, or more. Uh, the attached or detached provision is something that we do as a city have some flexibility on. The state is not mandating that, but based on what we heard, during our listening sessions, we believe that that is consistent with what, what feedback was provided. Um, and we're also looking at changing the way the maximum square footage is calculated to align with state re regulations, calculating on size. Uh, but we also would like to retain the minimum 600 square foot size of an ADU, ADU allowed on any lot, which is not required by the state, but again, that's creating a little bit more flexibility and then um, also retain or implement the maximum of 1,000 square feet, which is in the state act. Uh, we are also proposing to update the building height based on the requirements of the act, update the building setbacks based on the requirements of the act, remove additional parking requirements based on the act. And then this is something else is to remove the 50% maximum of the primary structure floor area requirement for accessory structures overall. Uh, this is something that uh, when we were conducting our review, we found a redundancy in the existing ADU regulations, um, which is related to the floor area requirement, um, as this is generally located elsewhere in the code. And we felt that by removing this, we would again provide a little bit more flexibility. It's a requirement that's in there, but it's not really serving any purpose because it's addressed elsewhere in the code. So since we're in there making some amendments, we propose to remove that as well. So based on all of this, staff recommends that uh, the Planning Commission approve a motion to recommend the adoption of the zoning timeline and accessory dwelling unit code amendments to the City of Tucson Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Struve. Really great presentation for the third time there. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, would uh, does any of the commissioners have any questions um, related? Real to quickly, questions? I just wanted to um, announce that uh, Commissioner Zajir has joined the meeting um, and is here as well. Very good. Welcome, Commissioner Zajir. Um, so at this time, I'd like to entertain any questions from the commission to staff related to the item. I will start with Commissioner Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, uh, I was reading through the conditions and I thought number eight might cover two separate issues. Um, it talks about guidelines that are in zones that are uh, more restrictive. And then the second sentence talks about um, they're not required to match the exterior of design, roof pitch, or finished materials of the single family dwelling. I think that's for all sites, not ones that are restricted by more regulation. That's number eight of the red lines. Seems like those are two separate 
items or um, yeah, uh, Commissioner Martin, I think uh, what we can do is we could separate those out so that they are two separate items just for clarity purposes. I'm related okay. to that. Um, then under D, it says accessory dwelling units, or except, except for ADUs. use. Um, thanks. Um, under the non-residential uses, it points out that the uh, Accessory dwellings would be included in the lot coverage calculation, which I think you kind of defer to when you say in the ADU standards that it has to comply with the normal restrictions for the, um, the principal use, but I don't know if you want to add that. It, it's added in the next section just as kind of a let people know. So Just added for clarif clarification. clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then talking about the height, I guess that's covered by number seven, where it says that accessory dwellings, dwellings must be developed in accordance with the dimensional standards of the principal land use. So that's where you can go up to the additional height. Mm -hmm. so that would be where you get to the 25 feet or whatever the zone allows. Yeah, so um, I, I think what we ended up doing was we, I think we remained silent on that just because it is based off the zone um, and the 25 feet. It, almost all of our residential zones have 25 yeah, feet. Yeah, but, but it defers back to the yeah, exactly. normal principal use on mm -hmm. the site. So I, I was conf a little confused because it doesn't say specifically that you can see the height of the principal structure, but if you mm -hmm. develop it based on the what's allowed in the zone, then you can. So, so mm -hmm. does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. We could, yeah, we can. Yeah, we're you are you suggesting a clarification related to that, or is it? Um, I mean, no, I'm just saying that I I didn't. I just got it after listening to the presentation that when I went oh, to okay. look at that section that refers you back to the section that oh. allows the height. It doesn't say you can exceed the height with the ADU. Mm -hmm. It just says you have to comply with that zone. So, um. Right, I think that would be, um, Commissioner Martin, I think that's item seven or standard seven, except right. as specified above, right. yeah. So, so it, once I read seven, I realized okay. that it refers you back. It doesn't specifically say it, but if you go back there, you'll find out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. Uh, Commissioner McCancy, you were next. Yeah, thank you. I just want to, uh, <clears throat> I missed the uh, last meeting, the uh, the discussion, so I'm a little behind here, but um, just want to make sure I'm hearing this right. You you can uh, put now two additional ADUs on any lot size that can fit them as long as you meet the setbacks? Um, yeah. Yes, Commissioner McCancy, it's, it's, yeah, it would be two ADUs on any residential lot. Um, with the single family home right. um, for that, uh, that is correct. So it doesn't matter the original lot size, you can still just cram two of them in there. As long as you meet the lot coverage, okay. lot, lot setbacks, okay. yes. And, uh, and then second, um, I think the, uh, one of the uh, comments somewhere was that, you know, the new, new standard should only comply with the minimum required to meet the law is you know, the changes that we're proposing in here. And I'm just, I guess asking, do we think that we've done that? That we're uh, just kind of meeting the minimum requirements of the law. So Commissioner McKenzie, all except for really two areas, um, it meets the minimum of what's required by state law. The two changes that we made was the attached D. So in the law, it says you can, you're allowed one attached and one detached ADU. Um, we basically are silent on that. So you could do two, two, two attached, two detached, et cetera, one, one or one or the other, just for flexibility purposes. Also, we, um, you know, there's less of a possibility with a detached unit than an attached unit to, for a house to potentially be delisted and that type of thing. So it just provides for more flexibility. The other one was the 650 um, kind of floor square footage. Um, that's something that we had in our previous one. So, you know, I don't think there's gonna be many cases where 75% of the principal structure is less than 650 square feet. Um, but in that case that there is a less than 800 square foot um, 
primary structure or principal structure, you would be allowed an ADU 650 square feet on that lot. And that was something that I think was pretty positive with the, sorry, was pretty positive with our previous code uh, amendment, um, just especially with our, with our, um, our model plan library, um, it allows for that standardization um, within the model plan library. So you know that at least a uh, 650 square foot uh, ADU would be allowed on any lot. And then uh, lastly, the, uh, the changes that were, or the modifications that we're proposing or recommending, um, they, they are prohibiting uh, putting an ADU in, on the front part of the property? Um, was that not uh, addressed thoroughly or whatever? Yeah, so Commissioner McCancy, yeah, so there is language in the bill that says building frontage needs to be the same as a single family home, but it speaks to building frontage and not necessarily placement on the lot. Um, so this was a conversation we had previously. What you can potentially do is you could, if you had like a smaller home in the back, you could swap that and where the new home could become the principal structure and the, a the existing building could be the ADU. Mm -hmm. So there's already an option on how to do so. Um, this just wouldn't allow something different than what we previously did, which would be an ADU in front of a principal structure. Right, okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner McCancy. Um, are there any other commissioners that would like to speak? Um, we'll just move down the line. So Commissioner Lampo and then uh, Commissioner Walzak here. Yeah, I just have one quick, it's just a clarification. I don't think it has in much of any impact. Um, but when I'm reading the, the language, it says ADU may be up to 75% of the size of the primary structure. Um, I, I think it's probably obvious as, as it was able to spell it out that we're talking about the ground footprint of the primary structure, right? Uh, that is correct, yeah. So that's the, the if you look at the definition for gross floor area in the Unified Development Code, that's what it is. That's yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Commissioner Small. Uh, Commissioner Lampo? I just have one question. What happens after 180 days? <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> I mean, I think it needs to be crystal clear. This is what happens after 180 days if it's not approved or denied. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are other states, 180 days lapses, and it looks automatically approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think ultimately it would be one of those situations to where we would be pushed to obviously make that decision, um, but we don't necessarily want to be in a situation to where we automatically approve or deny after 180 days. So I. I think it was intentionally left kind of vague within the state law to allow for that flexibility when it comes to that. Yep, I guess I did have one more question. So so pads are not required to adhere to a 180 day shot clock. And what was the reasoning for that? Yeah, so um, a lot of times the planned area developments, which are generally master plan documents, they have kind of flexible code. So usually you have a base zone, but then you make changes to it. And a lot of it's really our larger projects. Um, they have a longer review time. So they come in for a pre-pad review that sometimes takes a couple months. Um, so that is the reason, just because there is generally a longer timeline and it requires a lot more review than a normal, just kind of zone to zone rezoning. So do they have any sort of shot clock associated with them? Um, they are, a, hmm? they, have, they have a shot clock that is related to when it is um, accepted to uh, when it goes to the zoning examiner. So it has a 70 day shot clock there to kind of keep it moving, but there's that front end portion, the planning portion that really does take a while and that's the reason it's exempt. Okay, and then last one, the, the five foot setback is just so strange to me. Um, and I've read the, the way it's written in the legislation and it's, yeah, it's, it's written very strangely. Um, and the reason why it's strange is because it seems as though use and benefit easements are becoming more popular. Those straddle the property lines. So if you have a 10 foot use and benefit easement, that's right next to that five foot setback. Mm -hmm. If you have an ADU sitting right next to that use and benefit easement and PEP says we have to get into this use and benefit easement area, what happens to the ADU? So yeah, so um, it wouldn't override any any like utility easements or anything of that sort. So that would be a part of the review process. They would have to come in with a survey. They'd have to show where those easements are, show that it's outside of those easements. So if there is a 10 foot you know use easement that's there, 
they wouldn't be able to build it within that use easement, and that would be a part of the review process. So this is just that minimum that you could potentially do if there aren't any other kind of, I don't know, restricted element, restrictive elements or things of that sort. Thank you, Commissioner Lampo. Uh, Commissioner Walczak? Um, thank you. I keep looking at the example on one of the slides. Maybe you can go back a few slides to that ADU example that's sort of like 90 degrees adjacent. And it, it just makes me wonder, can two ADU units be adjacent to each other? Um, yes, they, they could um, potentially be adjacent to each other. You could actually, I believe you could have what would a be duplex? similar to a duplex. Um, with two ADUs that are attached. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question just as it relates to the, the third ADU unit, if you will, and, and part of that stipulation is that it, it shall be deed restricted to be affordable. What is the city's process for verifying that it is deed restricted? Uh, I think that kind of couples with a role in, in uh, how CCNR is playing to this as well. So just generally, globally, how do we as a city enforce those types of documents? And what is the process of if we come in with a third ADU to, you know, do we have, have, a, have to have a copy of that deed restriction? You know, how is the city planning to enforce those things there? Yeah, so um, this is one of those ones that was really challenging when we were trying to go through and figure out heck, how do we manage um, a whole bunch of random ADUs throughout the city, um, really. I'm not sure how many people are going to actually utilize this, but um, we, the way we've talked about it internally is that you would have to prove um, when you come in to have your plans reviewed that you have that deed restriction um, for an affordable unit on that. Um, and that's, that's basically how we would make sure that um, that's the case. Uh, there, we don't have the capacity to go through and continually enforce that over time and go and do you know, <laughs> checks on properties to make sure they're doing that, but this would at least, uh, you know, yeah. Well, yeah, that being the case. Yeah, I mean, Chair Wellett, I think that's something we'll need to continue to monitor and look at if there is some enforcement needed over time and would work with other partners, code enforcement, or housing department, et cetera, um, to monitor that over time. And it'll be based on kind of the volume that we're seeing and things like that. Right, right. Thank you. That's, that's the only question I have as it relates to that. Are there any other questions uh, from the commission before we open up? Uh, Commissioner Small? Oh. I just need to follow up. Um, Oh, am I on now? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, uh, relative to Commissioner Lampo's uh, question about the uh, uh, public utility easement, I did find a, a paragraph in here. I think, what would we say? It's on B8E. An accessory dwell, and I quote, an accessory dwelling unit may not be built on top of a current or planned public utility easement unless the property owner receives written consent from any utility that is currently using the public utility easement or may or that may use the public utility easement in the future for what it's worth that's missing that was, was that was from 2720 the state bill that is from 2720 okay I think we'll look into that. I think that's something we review for for any development. That's why we didn't specifically put it in the section of the code related to accessory dwelling units, but we can certainly look into that. Um, and then, Chair Well, we want to make one correction um, and for the commission, which is that this use specific standard number six, so B6, that should say the side and rear setback rather than the front and rear setback. So the minimum side and rear setback for an ADU is five feet. Thank you. Um, are there any other uh, questions for staff from the commission? Uh, Abriza, it looks like your hand might be up or you might have something to, to add. Uh, yes, um, I'm, I apologize for being late. Um, had some computer problems and continued. I'm not sure, maybe um, Mr. Pino is having problems. Um, I have the sound turned up on my laptop all the way, and I'm not sure if it's the mics in um, the council room, 
um but i can still barely hear you guys and i'm it could be just my laptop so i was just wondering um if um count uh commissioner pino are you having a problem hearing um some of the commissioners need to speak more clearly into the microphone for sure okay all right all right so um my hearing, I guess, is still okay. Um, no, um, I watched um, the previous um, commissioner meeting, and so um, that is the only question I, I had. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zujir. Um, So are there any other questions for, for staff from the commission? Seeing no other hands wave or folks jump up here. Um, if I could now open, um, I believe it's time for the, the public hearing for this item. So at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing to members of the public who would like us like to speak about the item. In general, there's a three to five minute time limit um, per speaker, which may be, discretion, may be extended at the discretion of the chair. Members of the commission may ask questions of the speakers, but we do not, or we do ask that each speaker be timely as we want to be, want to make sure that we get to all those who have uh, voiced a, uh, uh, or has expressed a, their desire to speak. Um, we have one person here in, in, in the room with us. So I'm gonna take that speaker first and then we'll turn to any um, folks online for that. So the first speaker I have is uh, Miss Lane, if you would mind uh, coming up to the podium, turning your mic on so we could all hear and then I'll keep the timer going and let you know um, when, when your time is approaching. Okay, good, you can hear me okay? <laughs> I think it might be. This one? Yeah. Better? There we go. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Valerie Lane. I am the owner of the Urban Infill Project and a practicing architect with a focus on housing. I've worked with City of Tucson residents on the upkeep of our neighborhoods for 16 years. I started the Urban Infill Project a little over a year ago, and since then, I've sold 20 uh, sets of pre-permitted construction documents for small-scale housing units. Some have been used for ADUs and some as new construction on empty infill lots. I am entrenched in the usability of this code and how it's impacting local people. This Casita bill and the upcoming changes in House Bill 2721 that addresses missing middle housing are heavy handed legal actions mandating that cities implement zoning solutions to an out of balance demand for affordable housing. One aspect of affordable housing is ensuring that ex ensuring an accessible pathway to the permitting and construction of new housing units. Therefore, the charge is for cities to remove as many barriers as possible so that homeowners and small scale local businesses can build success around the industry of housing and construction. This includes a robust sales and rental market. One glaring barrier that comes in the form, comes in the form of impact fees. These are state mandated fees and if we are to address affordability in our cities, then we need to find a creative solution for eliminating or reducing these fees for small scale housing developments. We can look at the way we define a housing unit, unit or we can push back on the state to allow us to eliminate these fees for any, added, uh, any unit added to a parcel that has an existing residence. To allow up to three ADUs for a one acre site and then be able to charge $4,000 or more per unit is a hindrance to the kind of development we are working to entice homeowners and small scale businesses to engage with. A second barrier is the current threshold for when commercial site requirements and development packages are needed. The development package permitting and review process is cumbersome and expensive, adding many months to the process. Bringing a residential site up to commercial standards can cost up to $50,000 and added time and cost uh, these added time and cost are a hindrance to the access for small scale and new developers to contend with. This will further allow bigger out of town developers to dominate the market of missing middle housing in Tucson. The requirement for a development package should be brought to five units across the entire residential code, not exclusively for ADUs. This will be a cleaner administrative change and will positively impact the next phase of code changes imposed by the state. This change would also alleviate heavy workloads from city staff as it relates to low impact development and construction. A standardized and shortened site review process for ADUs and missing middle housing 
would add to the predictability of process and allow the city to accelerate the success of the ADU code we worked so hard on over the last few years. The new changes before us also present the notion of regulated affordability through deed restriction. Anytime we push forward the idea of more regulation, we add workload to the city staff in unpredictable ways. Rather than thinking of regulating affordability of individual housing units, we might make a bigger impact to affordability by looking at this as an opportunity for the city to develop a grant or public funding source subsidy specific to low-income homeowners and neighborhoods to build ADUs. By helping to mitigate high construction costs in lower income areas, we help homeowners create homes that can be rented for a reasonable monthly cost that fits within their immediate local fair market value. I would also like to say a couple of quick things about preserving the unique and special qualities of our neighborhoods. To expand on the work done in recent years to reduce heat island effect, heating and cooling related operational and environmental issues, and aesthetic concerns around low quality construction, we might take this opportunity to require one native tree and one retention basin per new housing unit. This could nicely be tacked onto the gray water ordinance to entice people to tie their gray water features to the site during the construction phase. Because we are tasked with allowing for two story ADUs in traditionally single story neighborhoods, we can address public concerns through pri uh, concerns around privacy and quality of space by requiring privacy mitigation for upper level windows and creating exterior buffer zones between buildings. Tucson's flexible lot development code already has many applicable components that could be claimed here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is hard work <laughs> and I uh, personally am very appreciative uh, for all the, all the time you guys have put into it. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lane for your comments. We really appreciate them. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Lane at this point in time? Seeing none, very good, thank you. Um, are there any speakers online who would like to speak? Go ahead and raise your hand or shout out. All right, I'm not hearing or seeing anyone. Looks like some folks are coming in. If you want to chat, now is your time. <laughs> well, all righty. Um, not seeing anybody else raising their hands online. Um, I would like to go ahead and ask for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. So, second. So it looks like we have uh, a motion and in the second, uh, do we need to do a, all those in favor? So I appreciate your comments, Ms. Lane. Um, it's kind of contradictory getting rid of the uh, commercial requirements for up to five kind of takes away from the requirements to plant trees and to put in basins. So. Um, you know, I think with the ADUs, it'd be nice to have that, but I think up to five would be uh, detrimental for those two issues. So. Very good. So now we go into roll call, right? Is that right? Oh. Very close. I, I think it was just a motion and then a, you need the a vote hearing. to close the public hearing and then, yeah. Okay, so can I ask staff for a roll call on a vote to close the public hearing? Oh. Certainly, uh, Chair Wellett. Uh, aye. Vice Chair Ortiz Aquino. Aye. Commissioner Lampo. Aye. Commissioner McCancy. Aye. Commissioner Martin. Aye. Commissioner Small. Aye. Commissioner Walzak. Aye. And Commissioner Zagir. Aye. Very good. Uh, so the, the public hearing is closed now. So I'd like to open this up to a general discussion by the commission of the proposed uh, UDC amendments here. Um, anybody want to start us off here? And I'll jump at once. <laughs> 
we'll, we'll start down there on the sure. outside. Thanks. I, I don't have a I don't have a question about the proposed amendments. I think I did my homework. I watched the last meeting and um, saw some of the greatest hits from there again here today. Um, but in response to what um, Valerie Lane was saying, at what point would this commission make some recommendations for planning staff and then mayor and council to consider in terms of, for example, requiring native vegetation planted? Would that be here? Would that be another time? I mean, I'm not sure how um, this is my first meeting. I'm not sure how you make these kinds of recommendations, but I do think that that's a really good idea. Um, and one other thing I need to ask about, just because this is coming from Ward 1, is about alleviating impact fees for ADUs. And that's, I have a really, uh, to piggyback on that as well, what is, is the city considering any type of relief? I know other communities have looked into, particularly Flagstaff, when folks are coming in to develop affordable housing units, they, they provide some relief on, you know, permitting fees, et, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm curious, has the, the city started looking at possible avenues to take where we might be able to, for these Obviously, it's not for all market rate ADUs, but those that are deed restricted ADUs, is there an opportunity that we might be able to explore to start lessening those review fees for those to, to keep them more affordable? Sure, yeah, um, Commissioner Welzak and uh, Chair Willett. So I know Mayor and Council have in the past expressed um, the desire to address uh, impact fees and ADUs with impact fees. I know right now we're currently in the process of um, revising our impact fees. So I think that's gonna be part of that conversation as that kind of evolves over, uh, over the next year or so. Um, going back and just kind of related to, you know, additional vegetation and that whole um, situation, I will say that in House Bill 2721, there is the requirement that for units, one to four units, which is, sorry, the yes is the middle housing bill um, there is a requirement that those would have the same, the, all those four units would have the same requirements as uh, the basically single family home. And so as it is right now, we don't have those requirements for a single family home, but we do for our commercial standards. So we're gonna have to reconcile both of those. So I think that'll be a, a, a conversation that we're going to have to have um, as we move forward. And I think that's that's probably at least from what I see is probably the, the best place to really start to have that conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments for staff? Uh, yeah, so Dan, that would happen probably next year since that's a 2026. Yeah, so Commissioner Martin, sorry, I should have clarified. Yes, yeah, so that bill we have until um, January 1st, 2026 in order to come into compliance with that. Just a random question. How often does the city undertake review and revision of impact fees? Is it set every two years? Um, sorry, uh, yes, Commissioner Lambo, it's every five years. Five years. Any other discussion? Um, I have a, just a kind of a macro question, comment. Um, the, uh, I mentioned this to uh, Carla while we were eating pizza, but uh, oh, yeah. Um, what what is motivating this sort of emphasis on doing ADUs uh, at the state level and there, or pushing it at the uh, you know at the local level? I mean, you know, I know we've had you know whatever in our codes and standards already, but what's 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 prompting this move? And is it something that you know, we're going to have 100 of these, we're going to have like, you know, 50,000 of these in uh, in 10 years. You know, I mean, what's, usually there's some, someone, something motivating this kind of thing somewhere in the, uh, in the, you know, system. Um, but I'm just curious where, where this is coming from. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, the state needs housing. And the state then went, we're going to preempt local zoning controls, and that's what they're doing, and they'll continue to. 
Yeah. So yeah, Commissioner McKenzie, it, it, it is um, a response to uh, just the lack of affordability in general in, in the state and the housing crisis that we're dealing with. So state legislature is looking at ways to address supply issues um, really throughout the state to try to help bring down costs. ADUs is one of those that they're looking at. We have the middle housing bill, the rezoning bill, um, so it is preempting zoning uh, in, in several of our, um, in, in our municipalities, um, but really with the goal to help to bring down cost and address some of the supply issues that we're seeing in, in, our, in our cities. Um, as far as ADUs in general, um, there is pretty good um, kind of uh, data on what they've done in uh, California Oregon and the impact that uh, really loosening up accessory dwelling unit standards has had on housing supply um, and kind of uh, within those areas. So it's been pretty successful in, in California as far as just providing additional supply, um, especially doing so in a way that doesn't necessarily, that kind of allows for you to increase uh, within existing areas and for infill. So it's so it's it's been effective in other places in increasing supply, reducing costs, and uh, improving for affordability, as opposed to let's say unintended consequences like you know fifty thousand new Airbnbs. Yeah, and and so I. I... I will say what we've seen elsewhere is that there isn't a huge proliferation of accessory dwelling units with this. They're generally dispersed. They're not all necessarily in one area. We've also seen related to you know short-term rentals, there's a much larger impact on smaller kind of, uh, kind of tourist communities um, than we see in some of the larger cities as well. So um, from what we've seen, the impact of short-term rentals on a place like Tucson would be much smaller than it would be on a place like Sedona or Flagstaff. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. I'll, I'll just add that I, I think it's uh, remarkable that this bill was bipartisan. This is uh, in our legislature, that almost never happens. Um, also, these bills that were passed were the second crack at this issue after them being sent back and hammered out. I think they were at first a little bit, um, I don't remember exactly what they addressed about them, but um, they were spearheaded by two uh, younger lawmakers in, based in Phoenix whose primary issues are housing affordability in their communities. And I think that this came out of a frustration of local communities not tackling the issue. Um, and then also, you know, I think the first two that the first two bills that were defeated were because the League of Cities and Towns banded. Sam, together hear you. Said, oh, sorry, banded together and said we don't. This this goes too far. Um, and so I think the message coming out of the state was, local small uh, cities and towns need to fix this issue, or we're going to fix it for you. So, to answer your second question, I do think we can expect more of these coming. Um, but I also think that if we can. Uh, restore balance to our legislature, we can also potentially address issues like being able to mandate short-term rentals in our own communities as well, because currently we're forbid forbidden from doing that. Yes, thank you. And I, I would like to add, just coming from the, the state planning conference, it's really nice to hear that the city is very progressive on these, these items as opposed to other communities in the state and our it makes it seem like a, a minor lift for us as opposed to some of these other communities are having uh, experiences with this. So I do wanna uh, give a round of applause to staff here for being proactive on that there. Um, so at this point, it, it sounds like we're, we're wrapping up the- My discussion. hands up. Oh, sorry, Abriza, I didn't see you over there. Hi, um, uh, my camera's kind of funky and my lighting's funky. Um, so I read, um, uh, a lot of the comments that um, you had at the some of the open houses from the residents and stuff, and there was one that um, it interests me. I'm sure I'm sure that it's covered in the standard PDSD, like blue staking and everything. But um, as far as concern as existing utilities that run through people's yards, like a gas line coming from the alleyway or from the um, especially from the back part of the yard rather than from the front part of the yard. Um, 
um, that um, the building sites for ADU, once you build over something like that or a, um, a, uh, a sewer line, um, to go back and repair it, especially in some of our older communities, might be difficult. Um, so um, if you're putting a couple of ADUs in the backyard and you're going over and uh, say, and maybe in a buried electric line or a buried gas line or even water line, is there any provision? And then you are set back to only five feet to get back to if you have to make a repair on that aging line underneath a building um, is going to be extremely expensive and could cause, um, especially if it's sewage or water can cause damage to adjacent properties. So um, I'm not sure about the PDSD, um, you know, UDC codes on something like this. Is there a provision that um, older and older communities where um, blue stake, you do do the blue stake, is there any inspection of say an aging water line or sewer line? Uh, yeah, so um, Commissioner Zadir, yes. Yeah, so uh, that would be a part of the review to where you'd go through, you do your survey um, and you wouldn't uh, be able to actually build through those easements. So that would be a part of the review process when you submit. It's not just for ADUs, it would be for all development, um, but that would be addressed in the, uh, the development review stage. Not not the easement, but I mean, it. you have an easement, but then it goes across the backyard and you build on top of the sewer line coming into the main line house and then something happens and it goes awry. Um, the sewer line fails if it's poor or it um, hasn't been replaced in 50 years. Um, that, you know, that's my question. I understand the easements um, required. So that's just a, aging infrastructure. Yeah, it, even um, a situation like that, that would be a part of your plan showing exactly where your sewer hookup is. Mm -hmm. um, and you would have to show how you were citing it in a way that it wouldn't affect the existing hookups and everything of that sort. So it is it is a part of that review to ensure that you're mm -hmm. not causing an issue when you're going through and citing your accessory dwelling unit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commiss Commissioner Zajir. Um, so at this point, if no one else has any- One more random question. So. In the design standards, what's the minimum curb to curb overlay? So we're not adding any extra parking for ADUs. So they're going to be parking on the street. What's the absolute minimum width for a street in the city of Tucson? Um, yeah, I think. Are you referring, uh, Commissioner Lamp, are you referring to new construction or? Um, so I'm not sure what that width is. Um, I think it varies by subdivision. Others on the commission might know better, Chair, uh, Commissioner Martin. Um, but there's no requirement for that on-street parking. I think it's provided in most cases. Um, almost every neighborhood has that on-street parking. And there's also, I think this is acknowledging that a lot of sites, um, older sites that have where someone might want to add an ADU also have parking on site that is available, driveway, um, alley parking, things like that. So I guess then for either, you know, new construction, what's the minimum pavement width? So the standard 51 foot right away, the pavement width is 32 feet. 32 feet. But, so you have two feet of wedge curb to park. So you have 20 feet down the middle for fire trucks. If the Department of Transportation and Mobility is trying to narrow those down for the reduced pavement and heat islands. So but normally even the older streets in town have 30 feet of pavement. So um, I, I don't see that being a problem for no. most, uh, most streets. Especially with roll curve just fine. Any other questions, comments? Alrighty, I'm not hearing anything. Um, so at this point, uh, the chair would entertain a, a motion. I can try to do that. Uh, recommend to Mayor Council the Planning Commission, sorry, Planning Commission recommends the adoption of the accessory dwelling unit and zoning timeline to code amendments 
to the Tucson City Council with modification of number eight to split the text. I think we talked about that and the modification to number six to change from front to side yard. And I don't think there's anything else. I think that's it. May I have a second? Second. second. So it sounded like Commissioner Lampo um, seconded that one. So um, all those in favor of recommending this item to mayor and council say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion passes with a favorable recommendation of the ADU and zoning timeline. Unified Development Code amendment from the Planning Commission uh, will be sent to mayor and council there. Uh, so that takes us, uh, uh, Ms. Lane, thank you again for your, present, your presentation on this. We really appreciate it. Um, that brings us to item number four, which is a, a, an item that was brought to the commission last hearing regarding some of the procedures. So um, would staff please uh, present item number four, which is a potential amendment to the planning commission quorum requirements. <laughs> As you mentioned, Chair Willett, um, this is an item that was brought up at the last commission meeting. Um, it relates to planning commission quorum and voting requirements. And we will get back to where we need to be. Okay. Uh, here we are. So there was a discussion, uh, next slide of next slide please oh here we are uh of some requirements that are located within both the udc and also within the planning commission rules of procedure there are similar requirements that we wanted to bring up but before i get into what those requirements are and what the discussion is i wanted to note that any changes to these requirements would need to be made to both the udc and the rules of procedure so it would require a code change and we can talk a little bit more about that in just a moment okay um so in terms of quorum and voting for a body i apologize for that but um Within the UDC, it stipulates that seven members of the planning commission present at a meeting constitutes a quorum. Uh, this is regardless of how many members are currently appointed to the board. So if you have a full board, you have to have seven members. If you only have seven members currently appointed to the board, you have to have seven members to meet a quorum. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Um, also, under the current standards, if the commission is making a recommendation to mayor and council, a simple majority of those members present is required to approve an item, I'm sorry, I'm getting caught in the language, um, before the planning commission. Um, simple majority of those. So at that point, that requires that Required to approve or deny any matter, but it, essentially what it requires in this language and also in the um, Planning Commission language is that you need to have seven members vote in favor of an item to send it with a favorable recommendation to mayor and council. And so that means if you only have seven members on your commission, you have to have a quorum of seven people and all seven people have to vote in favor of that item to send it to mayor and council with a favorable recommendation. And so at last meeting that was brought up um, as, as a bit of a concern in terms of being able to meet that. Um, uh, and I wanna talk, uh, next slide please. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay, now it's working. Uh, and the rules of procedure for the planning commission say something very, very similar as well. Um, seven members of the planning commission present at the meeting constitute a quorum. A simple majority is required to approve or deny items before the commission, except requiring those recommendations to mayor and council. 
And so if we move down to that, um, seven members shall forward a recommendation regarding each to mayor and council. So it's, it's a little bit disjointed how it's written, but the, the end result is that you have to have seven in favor to positively recommend something to mayor and council. So the question is, before the commission tonight at discussion is if the commission desires to look into amending these requirements to provide a bit more flexibility in terms of making recommendations to mayor and council uh, keeping in mind that a code change would be required in addition to a simple administration um, administrative change to the rules of procedure. Uh, that is something that could likely be included with another code package. Uh, I don't believe that a change like that would necessarily be made on its own in a single code package though, but we do have some code packages coming. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Chair Rollins. Thank you, uh, Mr. Am I at? Thank you, Mr. Stroob, um, for that presentation there. So, I mean, I guess this is an item for us to, to discuss as a commission as to what our preference is on, you know, how, how a quorum is established, et cetera. I know in other communities, it's, you know, it's simple who is present um, as long as it's majority there and that as long as those majority vote in favor, that gets, uh, the recommendation gets forwarded on to mayor and council um, without the requirement of needing seven votes. So curious to hear your your guys' thoughts on, on that matter. So Commissioner Martin. Thank you, Chair. Well, so I, I sent down an email last week. I found that in the rules and regulations, the commission can bring up items that are related to the procedures of the commission. I've been on the commission for about eight years or so. <laughs> and sometimes we had eight commissioners and we needed seven for a quorum. I know there've been a lot of commission meetings that have had to be postponed because of lack of quorum. I may have not gotten on the doodle poll the past month because I had trouble and we might've had a quorum, but I think it could have been my fault because I couldn't get on the doodle poll. So I wanted to, we have to have a vote of seven commissioners to ask mayor and council to consider this. That, that's part of the rules and procedures. But um, over time we've, you know, when you have fewer commissioners, it's hard to get seven for a quorum. It's hard to get seven votes. So I proposed that it was a majority of the current commissioners at the time of the meeting. So if you had 10 commissioners, it would take six. If you have nine, it would take five. So that it's still a majority of members that are current. So um, we've talked about this for many years. And so I, that's why I'm trying to push this forward and not wait for mayor and council to act without out us asking them again, so thank you. <clears throat> um, is there a uh, is there a minimum uh, or a, a a number of uh, commission members that's required over and above the seven? I mean, do you try to adhere to a nine or ten or eleven or eight? You know, what's did you have a requirement for the size? Yeah, so Commissioner McCancy, there are 13 members on the Planning Commission, so that equals two uh, appointees per ward office and then one for the mayor. So in a, with if everyone is appointed, there are 13 members um, okay. on the commission. Okay. Commissioner Walczak? I was under the impression mayor and council recently discussed this broadly and had voted or did they not vote to recommend that a quorum consists of only the number of people appointed to and doesn't count the vacancies on DCCs? Um, I think they had that discussion. Um, unfortunately, this one is actually in the Separate. Unified Development Code. So in order to actually make the change for this uh, commission, it needs to be a full code amendment. Okay, but did they, they did pass that policy? Uh, Commissioner Walzak, yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the specific language, but it was largely um, DCCs that do not have specific um, kind of code dictated functions like planning commission. We have several other 
boards and commissions um, that planning and development services specifically works with that have very specific purviews, such as Board of Adjustment, um, our Historic Review Board. So it was largely the boards that um, do not have those very specific charges that are from a um, you know, city code, city charter, or unified development code that those new regulations apply to. So there was a few BCCs, boards and commissions that were exempted from that, but that was the general goal of that um, change to the regulations was to make it easier for boards to meet quorum. So if we were to adopt that same policy, I think I'm understanding that's what Commissioner Martin is saying. If we just count our quorum as the majority of people actually appointed not counting vacancies against us that would be in alignment with mayor and council policy if um commissioner walls like if there was a change like this it would go to mayor and council so they would ultimately be the ones approving or not this change to the code so i think um you know this is a discussion that the planning commission can have okay. um and then actually it's up to mayor and council to initiate the code change i should have said first um so it could be a recommendation from planning commission to mayor and council to initiate that code change. So that would be discussed by mayor and council you know, at a study session. Um, as Carver mentioned, there's this would probably be part of a package of code amendments. Um, and we're looking at doing a code package next year sometime in 2025, where we're you know kind of doing some cleanup and other kind of small changes like this as a larger package. So that's sort of when we would see this uh, potentially getting on our docket of code amendments. Thank you, Commissioner Ann Coles. Did you wanna add something there? Oh, I would just uh, say that I agree with Commissioner Martin. I think it's a great idea and I, I don't think we should be wasting our time. Members of the public who might show up their time um, I think we've had issues with other commissioners not showing up to meetings and then we don't make quorum and then there goes my Wednesday afternoon. And um, I, I, I think that it's a great idea. I, I, I too agree with uh, Commissioner Martin. I think it's just common sense uh, or procedure that the, those who are um, present and, and part of, part of the uh, operation should, um, the quorum should be based on that. Commissioner McKenzie? Yeah, I do agree in principle as well. Um, I did want to ask uh, Commissioner Martin if this is something that's been talked about for years, what's prevented them from changing it? What prevented the change from uh, occurring? Well, I, I don't think that anybody's gone to mayor and council and, and asked for it. So, um, and I didn't think about doing that, but when I found the section of the code that allows us to um, recommend um, changes to the procedures of what we do. Um, I just wanted to get it initiated. Um, I'll be off the commission in February, so. <laughs> what about his legacy? Lawyer? Right, exactly, <laughs> leaving a legacy there. So it's just, you mean you're going to make a change and you're not going to benefit from it? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, yeah. quite honorable. <laughs> You know, and you know, Mr. Martin, <laughs> they had issues where people had to uh, conflict of interest and had to leave the meeting. So it's been we've had eight people, but one person had to leave. You know, so um, so it's just trying to initiate it. Um, I, I don't think Mayor and Council would initiate it without somebody asking. And I, I guess what I was was really wondering about was whether if it was it was if it was proposed in the past and then you know everybody wanted to do it that somehow it got beaten back for whatever reason what were those reasons that it got beaten back it was so mostly, it just hasn't been proposed it was mostly just dis discussed at the meeting and talked with staff and so staff informally says, and never really nobody took the ball and did anything about it yeah okay right. thank you. so okay. thank you so what's the process if we were to recommend approving this amendment mm -hmm. to both the udc and to our rules that it would go to mayor and council for approval mm -hmm. We're just recommending that Mayor and Council uh, consider it, initiate the yeah, consider the, the initiation of it. Can we get that on our next agenda then? That's that's the intention here is I, to. I have know, a question. Go through this, yeah, Chris, and I'd like to say something too as well. So, Chris Ortiz Pino. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that I think having you know, it, it can be frustrating, but I think having seven 
people on the commission present is important for having a, a diversity of opinions and, and discussion. And um, I don't, I think it can be frustrating. And I agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Martin, but I think it's important to have a minimum on the commission present to make decisions. The The part that frustrates me is needing a, a consensus among those seven to forward a recommendation to, to mayor and council. And if there was to be any amendment to that or code change, that, that's where I would be more focused on my energies. And, and that's that's perfect. Thanks for that, Commissioner uh, or Vice Chair. Um, I, I too, you know, it's we do a lot of great work and have a lot of great discussions up here. And if we don't have seven favor favorable votes, we don't get a recommendation. And so it kind of makes what we do here mean nothing to the to the mayor and council if there are not seven votes for that recommendation. Um, and so I think there is, I, I agree with there, there should be a set number of people. So there is that, you know, good, good brain power happening, but making sure when the actual vote occurs that it's not seven members or seven votes in favor in order to get a favorable recommendation. It should be very much so if it's a majority rules, then majority rules, in my opinion, on that, that front there. So the process oh. moving forward, uh, Commissioner Zajir, did you have something to add? Yeah. So um, on that, so so if it's a contentious issue and you have seven members there that are going to pass on in recommendation, three or four, four are against. So um, here's the whole thing is is it's that's a, a small number of people who would um, either push um, this through to the mayor and council. So you're looking at say, okay, you know, four people say, no, it needs better work, or there's a reason that they don't think that mayor and council should see it as it, uh, it's written. So not having, so, so I'm just, I'm just wondering, is this, so the majority rules, so when does that majority look like a very small number, you, you know, um, I agree on, I am, I, I'm probably one, um, I was away from Tucson for two months. I'm sorry. I, I had very few places where I had internet connections. So, um, um, and I understand the frustration of not, of not having a forum. Um, and, uh, um, but, um, I think that maybe, um, um, that a lot of thought needs to go into um um the number of people i mean our city's getting larger and um so maybe rather than reducing the number of votes is um to get something um approved is maybe more voices are needed i'm just I, i'm just throwing that out there and i know it's hard to get people to volunteer to be on commissions and stuff like that so um just wanted to add my two cents of um, maybe playing the devil's advocate on this where, you know, what would be the repercussions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that, that's not the... Okay. Um, so at this point, I guess the the and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan Korn, I'm looking to you. Um, so at this point in time, we need to kind of make make a vote or something for staff to to give you guys direction to come back at the next meeting with some some language um, to, to present to mayor and council. Um, I you would direct us to bring this back on the next uh, agenda. Um, so you could provide, you could take action and basically provide that recommendation to mayor and council. All right. So do I have a motion to direct staff to come back? <laughs> I'll, I'll make that, um, like to direct staff to, uh, bring this back as a action item at the next. Second. Uh, planning, Second. And, planning and zoning <laughs> commission meeting. <laughs> Sounds like we got some seconders here. So uh, I think we're, we're good on that front. So um, I don't, do we need any type of yay, nay on that? 
there for this direction from you guys. We need seven votes. So let's go ahead and, and just do a roll call to be uh, abundantly clear um, that we have those votes here. Very well. Chair Wellick? Uh, aye. Vice Chair Ortiz Pino? Aye. Commissioner Lampo? Aye. Commissioner McCancy? Aye. Commissioner Martin? Aye. Commissioner Small? Aye. Commissioner Walzak? Aye. And Commissioner Zagir? Aye. Very good. Thank you. So we'll look forward to hearing um, what, what you have to offer next, next meeting there. So that brings us to item number five, PDSD the staff announcements. Would staff please provide any updates to the commission? Yes, Chair Willett, a couple announcements. Um, some of you probably saw the announcement that our former director, Christina Swallow, has taken a new position with the city manager's office as assistant city manager over planning and development services and other city departments that are involved in, um, a lot of the departments involved in public works as well as private development. Um, so uh, she started that role several weeks ago and I am serving as interim director um, in the meantime. Um, additionally, I want to let you know that we are uh, working, we're very busy on the general plan update, the update to plan Tucson. We have postponed some community meetings that were initially planned to take place this month, um, as we're just trying to really finalize that draft and we're postponing those until we have a completed draft of the plan that we can share with the community for public comment. So we're just adjusting our fall outreach timeline slightly um, and still anticipate multiple opportunities for public input this fall on the draft of Plan Tucson when that is released and still working towards our timeline of voter consideration and hopefully approval in November of 2025. Um, and still on track to bring this to the Planning Commission in early 2025 for study session. And then um, as a reminder, there is a state requirement that Planning Commission hold at least two public hearings in different locations of the city. So we'll begin planning for that later this year and we'll continue to update Planning Commission on um, what that, um, that timeline will look like. Very good, thank you, Ms. Manning. Um, at this point, that brings us to item number uh, six, which is future agenda items. I think you already covered those, but Dan, do you have more to add to those? Uh, yeah, so um, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so yes, there are a few items that will be coming up. First one is the corridor redevelopment tools. Um, we are currently working on um, setting up some public input for that. That'll uh, kind of lead to uh, revised policies and our plan to bring to the commission for a study session to review that. Uh, Menlo Park neighborhood plan will be coming up soon. Um, Grant Alvernon area plan update. They're doing an update to their neighborhood, to their area plan. So that as well, study session related to that. Um, and then also as, you know, periodically we've been wanting, we try to bring other strategic plans and different kind of uh, policies and policy documents uh, to the commission. Um, so uh, we are looking to potentially bring um, the updated PCHIP uh, plan and a presentation on that. Um, that is the People, Communities, and Homes Investment Plan. Um, we are working on a lot of things related to housing and housing policy, uh, so uh, especially relevant to a lot of the work that we're doing. So we'll be bringing an informational session to the commission on that as well. Very good, thank you. Um, that brings us to item number seven, call to the audience. Um, at this time, I'd like to offer the public an opportunity to speak on any subject that is not listed on the current agenda as a public hearing. If anyone would like to speak, would they please raise their hand or speak out to let us know? All righty, hearing no speakers and having, well, I see a hand up there. Is, is Margie a part? I'm, I'm a community member. Very good, Margie. So you, you need okay. to uh, repeat to me what you just, just said, because I'm having a hard time hearing some of your folks. Did you say I cannot speak to what you guys just talked about? For example, on the seven member quorum? You, we, you are welcome to speak about that. You're not allowed to speak about anything that was set for a public hearing. So that would have been related to the, the UDC code amendments regarding okay. ADUs and zoning timelines. But the discussion related to um, what constitutes a, 
uh, Coram, you're you're welcome to speak on that. So uh, I'll give you three to five minutes to speak there. Yes, that, I, and then I won't need that much time. I, I, I've i served on the task force that was part of a commission, and I understand the frustration that goes into when people don't show up. But I think it's important to have as many people set up to uh, to speak for the community. You're, we're all we, we we're all serving as community people for our community, and and as that is said, we need to have it, or I should say, you need to have as many people there as possible, instead of changing it to lower amounts. So going back to what I said earlier, I understand the frustration. Been there, done that, but and you got to keep plugging along as much as you can. And uh, I I strongly recommend not to change that. And yeah, that's just my that's my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. We appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, so that looks like that concludes the call to the audience. So the chair would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Very good. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending this evening, um, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care.